He who controls the memes controls the world. Hold my Bitcoins. I will die with my Bitcoins. That scares me. <laughs> that absolutely scares me. If, if the audience needs to know, I have terrible ADHD and horrible organizational skills. I'm good at talking, <laughs> but at actually making things happen. So it took uh, finding ourselves collectively on a yacht Once again, in Dubai to have the conversation. That was one of the most <laughs> epic interviews I've ever kind of sat in on. Can I interrupt your uh, podcast to lock my G-Wagon? <laughs> Scott Walker is an absolute OG in Bitcoin who started mining Bitcoin with Brock Pierce in the early days and he is never selling. He says he's going to die with his Bitcoins and tells us why. But in this wide ranging live conversation from Dubai, we not only talked about Bitcoin, but what's going to happen with the market, this cycle, how it's different, how it's same, how to invest in it, and of course, meme coins. You don't wanna miss this. It's one of my favorite conversations with one of my favorite people in crypto. That's dope. Five minutes ago, there was a pillow sitting in that chair with a Shiba Inu. That was uh, that was one of the most <laughs> epic interviews I've ever kind of sat in on. I was, I mean, so you're, you're the pillow. I am uh, officially, Congratulations. Yeah. So I have to start today with an apology because I've owed you an interview since... Singapore. But it's Singapore this year. <laughs> Last I don't year, remember. I don't even, yeah, I know. I don't even there remember. There was at least one or two Singapores where we had that conversation. Yeah, if, if the audience needs to know, I have terrible ADHD and horrible organizational skills. I'm good <laughs> at talking, but at actually making things happen. So it took uh, finding ourselves collectively on a yacht once again, in Dubai to have the conversation. Once again, in a uh, in a side location towards a uh, towards a big conference. Two yeah. men, no shoes. Two men, no shoes. <laughs> that's going to be the That's pretty the good, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. So, you know, as you alluded to, Token 2049 is happening somewhere over there. Uh, we obviously haven't been there because we're on this beautiful boat, but we're on this beautiful boat because of you and because DNA is making a comeback. So maybe you could give us the quick uh, rundown yeah, history. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I'd love to. Happening. I'd love to. Our, uh, our history and our background um, is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, really, uh, you know, started, you know, small startups. And uh, got lucky, I think, with timing and had a little uh, ringtone and software, uh, mobile software company go public in 2007, six or seven, and uh, sold my shares not long after. Uh, met, this, uh, met this young child actor, you know, genius uh, who I had introduced to, and uh, we became friends. And we started just investing into uh, little software startups. Uh, pretty meaningless, you know, nothing, nothing of uh, nothing of success from 2008 till 2012. Uh, not long after that, we decided uh, to mine bitcoins. And I spent a lot of time reading and uh, really kind of fell down the rabbit hole, loved it. After uh, after our miners were obsolete, we decided let's just take our bitcoins and, and, and invest them. And the idea of DNA was born. Um, you know, since 2013, uh, June of 2013 was our first, you know, like the principles of DNA's investment. We've, uh, you know, we've probably gone and invested early stage into nearly a hundred projects. Um, lots of them that failed, some of them that did really well. And, uh, and finally in uh, 2024, we've, uh, we've decided we're gonna, we're gonna make a comeback. We're gonna take a, a bunch of the team and uh, we're going to do our best to find the, you know, the best early stage projects, help, uh, help get them funded, uh, take them on the road into beautiful uh, locations and, you know, introduce them to the, uh, you know, to the greater community. Crypto investors in the United States face some major challenges. One of them is that there's almost no way to get exposure to the asset class inside of your traditional investment vehicles. The other thing is the taxes. They are absolutely atrocious. What if I told you there was a way to solve both of these problems? Well, there is. And it's with a self-directed IRA from iTrust Capital. Guys, not only can you open a new self-directed IRA and fund it with the limits each year, but you can actually convert over from your 401k, your Roth IRA, any other IRA that you already have, and you can do that tax-free, just transferring over the balance, and then you can go to cash, buy as much Bitcoin as you want, and not pay taxes when you sell it. You absolutely have to try this if you are in the United States. Use the link down below. It's bit.ly slash itrust dash Scott. That's B-I-T 
dot ly slash itrust dash seott. You have to try this now. Okay, so it's April 2024. Yep. I think. Yeah, the <laughs> having hard these days. The having. The we having were just is, talking the about the having that. is now, and you're restarting. Yep. So to me, that means you have a hell of a lot of confidence that this uh, music is not stopping anytime soon. This feels like, and, and I know it's, I, I agree, it's not the first inning of this next cycle. Um, you know, but at some point be in the, over the last three to five months, as the buildup to, you know, the question of, was an ETF going to actually happen? Was it ever going to happen? Would it be successful if it happened? So that buildup occurred, and that certainly was the beginning of this cycle. Um, the ETFs did happen. Billions and billions of dollars in institutional capital came in, and it, uh, and it kind of shifted the narrative from Bitcoin as this oddball speculative asset kind of an underground thing that you know you and i have thought of you know like we never believed it was but the rest of the world did so suddenly it i think it became a little bit more institutionally acceptable um you know with blackrock and you know trillion dollar i was gonna say we got the larry fink treatment we have the Larry Fink treatment as our, you know, as our, as our main asset class of this crazy uh, industry, and so you know, with that and with that in mind, and with the the historical cycles of a Bitcoin having, and then knowing that over the next six to eighteen months, historically, for the better part of the last twelve years, we've seen the same thing happen: all time highs to Bitcoin all-time highs typically to the rest of the, you know, the, the altcoins, the different uh, other assets that get built in that wake. The, the DeFi summer, the NFTs, uh, right now it's the meme coins. You know, uh, what, what exactly will, uh, you know, will, will take us into the next level? I, I don't know, but, but we're gonna be here to watch it, that's for sure. But then the music stops. The music will <laughs> slow down. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, here's what I like to, here's what I like to remember and, and remind people. One of my really good friends, I was, I, I mean, I was, I, I was preaching to everybody, buy Bitcoin, just buy Bitcoin. Forget about it, buy Bitcoin. Oh, it's garbage. It's this, it's that. Back in, you know, 2012 and 2013, I'm like, come on, Dan. Um, and he lived in, he lived in France. And finally, Mt. Gox happened. Mt. Gox, the single exchange that managed over 80% of all Bitcoin transactions. Basically the whole world of Bitcoin collapsed, imploded, and everybody's assets were stolen. People's you know, life savings potentially were stolen out of that exchange. And six months later, Bitcoin still was there, still making blocks. People still said, you know, I, I still want some of that. It certainly, it, it crashed the price, but if there was ever a definition of the music stopping, that was the definition. Not long after that, my friend Dan said, I'm gonna start a new company. And he created a, an early, early startup, in, a crypto startup in France based on proof of stake, which, uh, which immediately imploded and failed, much to, uh, much to Dan's and my chagrin. I was, of course, an early investor into it. But it was just, you know, one of the, you know, one of the bumps on the path of this 10 year, you know, series of cycles and the music sort of slows down. It doesn't quite stop even when FTX steals everyone's money right from underneath our noses, right in front of the regulators, right in front of everyone. It slowed things down. Certainly it changed the, the time of the cycle, but Bitcoin still creating blocks. There are still use cases for, for smart contracts and immutable public ledgers. It's, it's, it's still really cool. But what do you make of the fact that you witnessed Mt. Gox in 2014 and then had to witness multiple Mt. Coxes, although to a smaller scale, as to you a said, small, it's not well, 80% of the entire ecosystem, but FTX, Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi, et cetera. You'd think we would have learned something. You would, um, you would. And like, obviously what, what I've learned is what the old school Bitcoiners have always said, keep custody of your assets. If you give assets to somebody else, 
they might lose them for one reason or another. And despite, you know, the, the Celsiuses and the block fires of the world who promised the sun and the moon and ended up delivering bankruptcy, that holds true. If you, if you can custody and keep your assets, those are safe. Maybe in this cycle, we found real asset managers that we can trust this time. Maybe they're not Maybe. running, you know, I mean, I, I'd like to believe that BlackRock and, you know, and, you know, and, and these types of, you know, custodians and, you know, and investment banks and things like that will be able to do what so many others in the past have failed to do, which is to successfully protect their customers. Their customers, but still not your keys, not your coins. Not your keys, not your coins. So you are, you know, you're, you're obviously, you're still trusting. Um, you know, at Coinbase, you're trusting someone. Yeah, you're trusting someone at Coinbase and almost all of these ETF issuers are trusting Coinbase. Which is kind of scary. Fidelity um, custodies themselves, and I believe you know, uh, Van Eck uses Gemini. I think everybody else has Coinbase, if I'm correct. I, I, I think you're absolutely yeah. right. And uh, that scares me. <laughs> that absolutely scares me. So if something were to happen to Coinbase cold storage, that could be a, uh, that would slow the music down. Yeah. Um, you know, without question. I, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, how Coinbase cold storage works. I hope that the, uh, you know, the, the, the major providers that have entrusted tens of billions, soon to be hundreds of billions of dollars into those cold storage solutions, you know, understand the, the security behind them. And a bit of due diligence this time. I hope, I hope. Because due diligence in the last cycle was that guy trusts him, so it must I, be that okay. guy is awesome. So it I trust that guy okay. to trust that guy, and that got Sam Bankman freed all the way to Capitol Hill. Somehow Sam Bankman freed sat there giving millions of dollars to politicians with customers stolen money. It's uh, that never ceases to amaze me. Um, but you know, when it's all said and done, I think the the it, the wash has been cleaned out a lot from that 2020 and 2021 massive cycle. I think we're, you know, we're, we're back with a whole new series of protocols, a whole new series of projects, really interesting, exciting, uh, you know, like it's a multi-chain world. I think we'll see more and more new interesting use cases. Solana has turned into, I mean, you know, like an, an absolute uh, monster with, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of new project launching on there every month. Um, it's a little rocky for them right now. Um, you know, maybe they will be able to scale, maybe they won't. But uh, but it, it never ceases to amaze me. Something I like happens. that we said, I like that we said, first of all, I will say, if you want to talk about music slowing and not stopping, Solana is another great example that I'm sure Bitcoiners would hate to hear it because many of them probably would have liked to see a lot of these things die, but they also survived that cycle, they right? The, the Solana, you're talking about an $8 asset that went back to $200, for better or for worse, whatever you think of it. But they are having scaling problems. And I kind of had to giggle when you accurately said launching projects, mm -hmm. but the reality is... Memes. Lottery, digital lottery tickets. Digital lottery <laughs> tickets with funny names. And, uh, and uh, you know, speaking of, with the success of the meme economy, which it exists. Uh, how exactly, you know, Dogecoin became a thing? I don't know. As a, you know, as a lifelong entrepreneur, I've always prided myself on trying to find a product market fit, something that, you know, improves on a problem in the world, somehow, some way, a better exchange, uh, a better custody solution. I've invested in these types of visionaries and these type of projects for so many years that the idea of placing my hard earned capital into a, into what is actually a joke of a coin. Um, you know, Doge was launched as a joke. Literally. Um, literally. And, uh, you know, and, and watching, you know, my friends at, uh, at, at Shiba Inu and seeing what kind of a incredible community has been built around there, it feels like the market has spoken, meme coins exist, and, you know, according to Elon Musk, he who controls the memes controls the world. Yeah, I think that we actually need to reclassify meme coins as the ones who have 
gained a certain level of traction that are actually seeking utility, whether they find it or not. And the outright cat with dog face, no shoe hat, literally Inu musk face, right. right? Which is meant to exist for 24 hours. Right. And the participants know that, I think. I would like to hope that the people buying that know that they're playing musical chairs. And then ones that have, you know, created a true ecosystem, have mm -hmm. an actual mm -hmm. community. Because, you know, to me, the meme coin community for 99% of them is nonsensical. Like, of course, just people chasing gains and mm -hmm. the community disappears with the price, much like 99% of N NFTs last cycle. But I would love if we could like reclassify a few of the meme coins that have survived uh, enough time or have gained enough market cap or have enough participants or a building because they're just not the same. And I think people look at them as this one sweeping basket. We should do that right now. Yeah. There must be two categories of memes. What are they? Uh, I, uh, my, if I had the answer, I would have given it before because I've been thinking about that. But we need to come up with something very catchy for it. Maybe by the end, it'll pop into our uh, head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's cir let's circle back because that's a, that, that that is a it's a, it's a true story. There have been a couple of incredible memes that have uh, you know been launched from nothing and turned into something, while most of them went from to nothing to something to nothing uh, immediately. The faster, the better. Yeah. I, I've heard many people of late make the claim that Bitcoin was the first meme coin. I've, uh, I've, I've heard the same thing. And, and I'd like to talk about that. I am, you know, I am a recovering Bitcoin maximalist. I believed, me too. I believed with all my heart that Bitcoin was the only use case for crypto. And anything else that came from that was really just for me, it was a way to try to increase my, my Bitcoin stake without mining and without you know, being a retail buyer. So I continuously went out and I, I, I took my precious Bitcoins and I gambled them on what I believed to be a project that would gain me more Bitcoins. And you know, what I learned and you know, I've, I, I've shared this story, I'm sure I've shared it with you before. You know, what I learned after the Ethereum crowd sale was um, like, t to me, Ethereum was another altcoin meaningless with a, with a tall, skinny Russian that was really smart. And, it, and, it, and the idea of smart contracts on a blockchain, I felt like, well, Bitcoin can also achieve that and, uh, and we don't need this. So after the, you know, after the crowd sale, um, I traded a lot of Bitcoins for a lot of Ethereum. And when Ethereum began trading, I immediately traded them right back. And, uh, and so, you know, I, uh, you know I, I did manage to increase my Bitcoin, but, uh, but it was a painful experience to watch Ethereum go from a dollar uh, where I sold mine to thousands of dollars. And, uh, and, and seeing that and thinking to myself, maybe there is more to this ecosystem than only Bitcoin. And I do believe that Bitcoin serves an incredible purpose. And I, I do believe that it's, you know, I do believe it is potentially a humanity store of value. I believe that is it potentially a, a form of money that will live for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, you know, will it become, you know, the most valuable currency on Earth? Could. It, it certainly could. Um, you know, today it's, uh, its market cap is around one and a half trillion dollars, which I think places it in the top 30 or so uh, currencies. You know, could it become a three trillion? Could it double from there? Certainly. You know, could it, uh, you know, could it, you know, could it 5x or 10x from there? Certainly, you know, any, any of those things could happen. Um, and what I've learned is as Bitcoin goes, so goes the rest of the ecosystem. And as long as I continue to see that, I'm going to continue to invest into the ecosystem and I will always hold my Bitcoins. I will die with my Bitcoins. What I find so interesting is when I was listening to you talk about becoming a recovering Bitcoin maximalist, I would say I'm the same. We should probably stand up, introduce ourselves like an <laughs> AA -A -A meeting. But there's levels to Bitcoin maximalism, mm -hmm. you know, starting at toxic, 
all right. the way down. And uh, depending on what level you are, you can get your membership card pulled from the from the level above, right? Yeah, the top. So I would say it's interesting because a lot of the early Bitcoin maximalists would have said that you had already committed a cardinal sin by oh daring by daring to invest in other things with your precious Bitcoin. If you had done it with dollars, maybe you could have gotten half your card back. Maybe. But to, but, but to commit the sin of trading your Bitcoin at the idea of something else at that point. Without question, without question, um, as a, uh, you know, I've, I've watched the community for a long time, as, as you have as well. And, uh, and, and certainly, you know, if I had chosen to only ever have Bitcoin and never try any other assets in this ecosystem. Had I not been there for the Mastercoin sale, um, and you know, had I not been there for the Ethereum sale and uh, and a number of these others, you know, I don't know how I would react. I, I you know, I, I genuinely have no idea. So I I get where they're coming from. I think their their way of communicating is uh, is is flawed. I've made the point, I've been eviscerated so many times by that community. I, I think wrongfully, but it doesn't matter. To me, the worst marketing, the, the biggest problem potentially for Bitcoin sometimes when you're looking at mainstream adoption is Bitcoiners. Without a doubt. Right, and, and, and I think their intentions are good, mm -hmm. but the messaging that uh, coming from a very toxic and angry, no, nobody wants to hear that, you know? Uh, it, it turns off people more than it uh, than, it, than it brings people in. I would make the argument actually, if we look factually, and this is something that I'll also maybe get you canceled for by talking to me, sorry. Last cycle, mm -hmm. as much as I think we'd like to believe that everyone came in and bought Bitcoin because of Michael Saylor and Tesla and all these things, which I, I think was a meaningful portion of the market, what turned people on was Doge and NFTs. NFTs, uh, people forget how big Flow Blockchain was with Top Shot, but Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. right? Elon Musk was talking about Doge. I remember anecdotally talking to CZ and other exchange CEOs on the show and saying, you know, what's happening with the exchange? And every single one of them at that time said, we have a three month waiting list. Nobody can sign up. They all want Doge. Robin Hood, same thing. I talked to Vlad, you know, and that's what everyone wanted. And interestingly, I think that this cycle, we expected this mainstream wave when Bitcoin hit new all time highs. I almost think that Doge needs to hit a new all-time higher. NFTs need to come back for all the underwater people to actually care about crypto again. Interesting, because you know, to, you know, <laughs> that's what your... they're underwater on. If you're holding Doge and you're down seventy or eighty percent, and you don't have Bitcoin, you don't care about the ETF. I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying, in, like, as the, a person who's underwater on that asset, imagine what happens to this ecosystem if somehow Doge returns to seventy cents, and uh, and the hundred million holders of Doge worldwide suddenly feel good about themselves, suddenly feel good about the ecosystem again. And they decide to take some of their uh, some of their doge winnings and put it into dog with hat. Yeah. But what's interesting about the memes this cycle, not to circle back on memes necessarily, but what I hear when I had those interviews now is that people were waiting three months to get onto a centralized exchange where they had to KYC and AML to buy a meme coin. This time, for better or for worse, they can launch in two seconds in a completely decentralized manner and people can buy and sell them at will without KYC AML. So taking what they're trading and the fact that it's a, it's a casino, the system at least I think has improved for the better. It's improved by a, uh, by a factor of, you know, by a factor of 10. And one of, uh, one of our portfolio companies um, uh, with Eyal Herzog, who really created the original concept around liquidity pools back with Bancor in 2017. And you know, his, his explanation of how these decentralized exchanges are working, it's, it's incredible, it's amazing. And I think there will be more of them rather than less. I think that uh, the ease and the ability of users to go out Find find some type of a crypto asset that they enjoy, that they believe in. It doesn't matter if it's a game or a joke or a, you know or, or or like a a new world changing technology. The ability for someone in India with ten dollars to buy some of that and potentially turn it into a hundred dollars is it's not going away. 
that you know that that amazing concept is uh, is out there and it's going to continue to perform the music will slow down at times the music will speed up at times but uh but we're you know we're we're part of this uh ecosystem we're going to see more of this rather than less i agree so back to the you know the the, the example of uh you know i know and met uh, an 18 year old kid who uh, was in high school made a you know made a fifty dollar bet on uh, on doge or on, on shiba and wound up with six figures dropped out of high school got a job in a uh, you know got a job in a tech industry and uh, you know has literally changed his life uh, you know he was here meeting with the shiba team uh, you know at the conference it's uh, it's absolutely incredible and uh, you know, so you, I, I know you had a point about the other ninety nine. Yeah, I mean, kids. that can happen. That that that's an amazing story that happens here uniquely. And uh, you know, for every kid who turns fifty into six figures, we got ninety kids who turn fifty into zero. But it's fifty bucks. Hopefully. Right. Exactly. Right. But but I, I do think that uh, the point is well taken. That it can be life changing opportunity for people. More interestingly, I think the life changing opportunity of him starting to build in the ecosystem is actually more compelling than the money that he may be made. And that, I think, is where a lot of it is going to come from in the future, the real that, opportunity. That, 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 and that, that feels like the future of what this industry has become. Um, and, you know, I, we go back to Satoshi and Bitcoin. Because of that creation, because of that technical, uh, you know, mind-bending creation that uh, that Satoshi did suddenly we have high school kids coding blockchains and making security software to check smart contract errors and uh, you know and to try and foil hackers and uh, you know and and suddenly this whole ecosystem with millions and millions of people in it are all engaged in in, in different aspects of the business um, I'm I'm super bullish long term. Super bullish. It's really hard not to be. So you obviously, I'm assuming with DNA, you have your tentacles everywhere in this industry, right? You guys literally know everyone. I've seen it between you and Brock. You know, you guys all over the place. That means that everything is presented to you at some point. You see it all. How do you decide what's worthy of an oh. investment and what's not or what's literally complete trash because there's a lot of complete trash yes um and so oh that is that that is just the hardest question and i can uh, you know i can share so many examples of you know from really you know from the from the 16 and 17 cycle seeing projects that looked i mean amazing founders uh you know amazing investor team uh, amazing story and and then some kind of oddball startup idea that didn't quite make sense and guess which one turned into zero and guess which one turned into you know the billion dollar thing and for you know for from my experience it's been you know there there's a there's a fine line between choosing based on only the founders uh believing in the founders Choosing just based on the technology, technology does not win, not in this business, not in any business that I've seen. So I think that pr timing properly in the market, um, yes. you know, my, my example of Bancor, which actually pioneered the, uh, the AMM and Uniswap was simply, it wasn't ready in yeah. 2017 the market wasn't there and now bancor is you know is worth nearly nothing and uniswap is worth billions and billions ride of dollars. sharing existed before the iphone but it failed right <laughs> exactly uber needed the iphone and, and so there, there there is a you know there's a unique combination of that especially in crypto and the cycles go so fast um you know you had DeFi summer and suddenly everything DeFi took off and went crazy followed by nfts and nfts became monsters and metaverse fall with the rebrand metaverse of, uh, with, to meta. yes exactly with meta. meta which you know and all of those things lasted momentarily but they didn't you know they didn't stand the test of time but do, don't the things that we're seeing now reek of that rwa d pin i'm not saying that, that that some of these things won't but i continue to say we get really excited about things and they don't happen as fast as they want Then people get bored they exit and then they go parabolic five right. years later yes oh without, without question and you know and and of course 
you know, which one, you know, which ones will be the winners, um, you know, which ones will fail. Um, you know, when you're an early stage investor and, you know, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to find seed stage and, you know, and, 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 and right after a seed stage for DNA. Again, as, as entrepreneurs uh, specifically, we, we envision the business and we kind of, we see the, uh, we see the entrepreneur's visions. And that's kind of what captures me. When I, uh, you know, when I see what they're doing and I, and, I, and, I, and I look at that and say, man, that looks like something I wanna join, I wanna be part of this team no matter what, that's where we make our bets. It's so funny because you hinted on probably the biggest truth yet, which is it just when you launch. Yeah. If you launch at the perfect moment when Bitcoin's at the right price and the hype is correct, you have such a better chance. You have such Whether a better chance. Whether the technology is good, you know, there's like the meme and crypto scams pump the hardest. Right. But it's kind of what you said. I mean, it's just if you launch at the perfect moment, then you can capture enough attention that right, you can actually right, right. see your, your uh, technology come to fruition. But that leads me to ask, why haven't we seen, I would argue out of Bitcoin itself and stable coins, why haven't we seen a true killer app yet? I think stable coins are absolutely a killer app when you see what's happening with them worldwide and Bitcoin itself, the very you know, initial creation. I, I, I would make the argument that, uh, that Ethereum improved on Bitcoin. Ethereum and the ability to write rules into a smart contract improved on what the original vision was. And I think that is a killer app. And between Ethereum and uh, you know all of the Ethereum competitors, and the layer twos and, and those other things, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in you know in network value in these different things. Um, it, it takes a long time, you know. It takes a long time, you know. Killer apps don't just happen overnight, you know. I mean, the internet existed for 30 years, right. and you know suddenly Amazon came around. And now, is Amazon the killer app of the internet? Is Google the killer app of the internet? You know, there's, there's multiple killer apps in, 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 in these technologies, and I think we'll see that with crypto. It's a fair point, which brings us all the way full circle back to Bitcoin, this cycle, which I find so interesting. You said Ethereum's a killer app, smart contracts, the ability to build these things. Taproot, whether intentionally or unintentionally, brought that capability. We have the having and runes. Brought it all back to Bitcoin. Right. So do you think, I've heard people say, you know, Bitcoin will capture it all now because it's the biggest base layer. I don't think so. I think we'll live in a multi-chain world, as you said before. But do you think that the Bitcoin ecosystem can capture a meaningful percentage of what was being built elsewhere? I've even heard some say that all of that in the end, now that we have this capability, made every other chain effectively a test net for Bitcoin. <laughs> we can take um, the things that worked and uh, ignore the lessons of the past that failed. I mean, the short answer is I would bet against it. Certainly it, within the next 10 years, I would bet strongly against it. Um, I, think, I think Bitcoin's best chance of massive worldwide adoption is for people like me who want to say, I want to own a Bitcoin. I'm going to own this Bitcoin. Whatever it takes, I'm going to own this Bitcoin. I'm going to do whatever I can to protect this thing. I believe that in 10 years, my Bitcoin will be valued higher than my US dollar. I believe that my dollar will be worth less and my Bitcoin will be worth more. So some of my dollars have to transition into Bitcoin. And I believe that corporations feel that same way, some. Not only Michael Saylor, others have done it. I believe countries are beginning to feel the same way. And as you start to see corporate treasuries, small countries, medium-sized corporate treasuries, medium-sized countries, suddenly, suddenly the, the use case for Bitcoin really becomes an alternative to fiat currencies. And that's what I really believe at its core it is. I, I believe really, really strongly that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, my kids are gonna be able to send your kids a, a, a little bit of value on a blockchain powered by the Bitcoin blockchain and it'll, it'll get there. And every 10 minutes that chain will update and 
I'm, I, I, I will always believe that that is the most important use case for Bitcoin. And all of the other things, I mean, ordinals are, they're fun. They create interest around Bitcoin and around the blockchain. It, it increases fees. I think it's good that Bitcoin fees are increased. I think it's important that Bitcoin fees are increased because we're going to zero rewards. Miners need to make money. Somebody needs to make money to secure continue to secure the network. Okay, and so it has to come. And it can't come from layer twos, can't. Um, that actually takes rewards off of the network. So the network has to become self-sustainable. And if that's because of ordinals or JPEGs or NFTs or whatever they're called on top of the blockchain, then I'm, I think that's great. I think anything that strengthens the long-term outlook for Bitcoin is good. And I think higher fees are good. I think buying a cup of coffee with Bitcoin is meaningless and useless. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I've done it. Um, I wish I didn't, you know, I wish I didn't buy a pair of jeans. I wish I didn't, uh, you know, pay for a round of golf. I wish I didn't get a fantasy football league with a Bitcoin buy-in with my Unless friends. Unless you won. I didn't win. <laughs> 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 you know, so I mean, I, you know, I can, I can think of all those stories. And, you know, again, I don't see Bitcoin as the ecosystem. And, and I don't see that as the ecosystem that's going to create all these other things. Where's the funding coming from? There's not. You see, like... It, as, a, as an early stage investor, when I see somebody building a new layer two that solves a real world problem for smart contract or, you know, or it connects Bitcoin with Ethereum and it does atomic swaps in between them, I think that is worthy of, of investing in. I think that has a chance to 10x, 50x or 100x over the, over the next period of years. That's where we're making our bets. So I'm talking a long time on this, uh, but no, I'm but I'm it. passionate about this. Uh, passionate about this. Well, I was just going to say, I think that uh, your description of your children and my children transacting value and your passion for getting that one Bitcoin and holding it for mm -hmm. dear life, no mm -hmm. matter what happens, was probably one of the more eloquent uh, descriptions I think of why this matters and why it's important, and maybe was the answer to my killer app question. The rest of it may or may not happen. But it doesn't have to because we already have Bitcoin. We already have it. All right, man. Thank you so much. I'm it's glad we finally got to do this. Oh, I could so do this, glad. by the way, for hours. So we're going to have to run this back. Absolutely. I'd, Maybe I, in Puerto Rico. Please. Uh, the invitation is still open. Awesome, man. I'll Thank see you, you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks.